Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Unlimited Justice. It's me, Phil. Uh, Lil couldn't make it, but we have uh, some of my other co-hosts. Will is here. Uh, Kristen is here. And, of course, the man himself who wrote what we're discussing tonight, Mr. Mark Wayne. I'm sure if you're a comic fan, you know him. Hello, sir. How are you? Good evening. I'm good. Thanks. He's written a few comic books over his time. Here and there. <laughs> yeah. One yeah. or two, right? <laughs> All right, so yes, with the one we were discussing tonight, Batman, Superman, World's Finest. Uh, as we record this, issue two, I believe, comes out tomorrow. So yep. it's not too late. Get on the train if you haven't yet. Uh, all right, so I'll I'll start us off, but I want everyone to get a chance to ask stuff. Uh, so the whole, th I mean, I love this story because it's like, I saw a review said, if you love Silver Age comics, you would love this, and I completely agree. Uh very silver. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, but that's that's a that's that's the kiss of death. So yeah. well, I don't know. You know. I don't know. For some of us, it isn't. I mean, well, yes, but we're dying off. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're dying of old age. So I mean, it's. I mean, it does it, have its like modern flavor too, but it's basic. I would say silver age in the fact that like Batman and Superman get along, and you know, yeah, ex like exactly, dark. exactly. I'm I'm fine with that. It that's and that makes sense to me, and that was kind of what I was going for. So. But my editor and my artist both have very strict instructions, which is do not let me be a nostalgia act, no matter what. Um, make it, you know, make it something that it's for everybody and not just those of us who uh, are on the edge of getting Social Security. <laughs> well, hey, if people read Silver Age comics, they <laughs> might appreciate them. I don't know. I mean, again, how many of us are there? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've been reading them, and man, there are some really great panels that you can take out of context. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not exactly what I'm going for either. But yeah, oh, well, no, I know. So, so is the now whole... that you know that we do that, you can make efforts. Yeah. Right. It. So is the whole thing that just you know it's a, it's quote unquote like is it out of continuity? But it's basically just like yeah, anyone can pick this up. You don't need backstory. You know, it's basically the purest versions of these characters. That is that was the marching orders. Those are the marching orders. That was exactly the mandate. It was look, we want this book to be accessible to all readers, and that means that you know while there's some cool stuff happening in the Batman and Superman books in continuity right this second, to have to line this up with th those con both those continuities at the same time just is a recipe for disaster. And because you'll never make that stuff. I mean, first off, Superman's not even on the planet right now and yeah, hasn't been for several months. So um, so the idea was, you know, not only make it so that it's it's sort of not exactly out of continuity, but just stepped back from continuity, maybe a step and a little bit in the past with the idea that, and use the marching orders too, which is let's get the purest version of these characters. Let's get the ones that, that people know and let's play with all the toys, which means we get Alfred, which means we get the Batcave, which means we get, you know, the Daily Planet, which means we get a Lois who doesn't know who Superman is and, and who has a secret identity and, and all these things that we get to play with. Doom Patrol. Oh. Yeah, it's like Doom Patrol, for instance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I... Yeah, does that mean it's the first Robin? Is it Dick Grayson? That's Dick Grayson, yes. And actually, in, in issue two, as you'll see, he has a line where... Supergirl compliments him on his on his long pants, and he says, "Trying him out." <laughs> it's a big Chris? step. That's a big yeah. step. Yes, that's a, that's why it's her favorite, Dick Grayson. And I believe, uh, did I see? So, are you gonna like start bringing in a bunch of characters from the DC universe? Because sure, I, I see. Uh, what is it? Issue four. We're gonna be getting Will's favorite, Hal Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, the part of the fun of this book. Mm -hmm. And part of the attraction to me is putting together stuff that I've never seen before. I've never seen Green Lantern versus Batman. I've never seen the Doom. We've never seen Superman, Batman, and the Doom Patrol together in a story. You know, we've never even seen Robin and Supergirl have a conversation. This is absolutely true. I couldn't find any time in which the Grayson and Supergirl have ever done anything more than share a panel. So those combinations, those, you know, those and also, I, I feel like with some of these characters who have been sort of back burner for a while, Metamorpho or whoever, I feel like I've got some interesting take on them that maybe you haven't thought about before that, that might make you intrigued about them if you didn't know them. Well, you know, the I think it was a, I don't want to say the S word, uh, but there's a really excellent timeless quality to the story. Yeah, thank you. That's that was what I, that's what we're going for exactly. Not not retro, but timeless. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, Will, for making make me look even more dumb. Uh, <laughs> Wait, what did you say? You didn't want to say the S word? Silver A. Oh, okay. I was, like, I was like, nostalgia starts with N. I'm confused. <laughs> And I mean, and is it like in a tradition of like that original world's finest book, which I know Kristen loves like that original. Yeah. I mean, that was my, that's my, that was my favorite book growing up. Superman and Batman together in the same story drawn by Kurt Swan, who was my all time favorite artist. That's that stuff. in you know, 66, 67, 68, that was formative material to me. And that's, I have very few print comics left. I've, I, years ago, I gave up my, at least the you know the, the floppy collection to uh, to someone for uh, consignment sale, but I've kept all the trade paperbacks. But all that said, so I don't have very few floppies left. But a big fistful of world's finest from that period has survived the purge. Right. So, and I know you're a huge Superman fan. I mean, we've discussed this before. So, is is this the pure? Is this the Superman you see in your head? Is this the pure version that you see without any of the baggage and? Exactly. And again, this is in no way to to cast shade on any of the more recent developments with Superman or, you know, John, John Kent or the marriage or anything like that. That's perfectly, you know, again, if that's your Superman, that is awesome. That's the beauty. The beauty you get to worship the church. You get to worship at the church of your choice. Right. It's it's it, Superman's a big enough character where he can be your favorite in this version or that version or whatever. That's fine. I work, I, it's not that I want to campaign to see that version back. It's more that that's the version that I can understand and can really dive into and really can do like a two hour Ted talk on the intricacies of this particular versions, you know, psychology and why he does what he does and what makes him unique. And, and that's, you know, that's a Superman I personally can connect with. And again, as I say, that is in no way to slam any other version of Superman, but this is this is the one that speaks to me, and therefore that's the enthusiasm that you're seeing come across on the page. And I and also I guess you love this Batman. You know, like I said, he's not a jerk. He doesn't have his hand in his pocket twenty four seven with just waiting to pull that kryptonite out. You know, just... <laughs> yeah, right. Again, he they're 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 friends. I mean, Batman can still, and you'll see in the in the oncoming issues. I mean, Batman is still. Batman, he's still, you know, the guy who is kind of serious and has a plan and, and so forth, but, and, and he's not quippy and jokey, but that's what Robin is for, frankly. I mean, it, the book really is Superman, Batman, and Robin, uh, and, and Robin plays, Dick Grayson plays an integral part in all the stories because he's the guy who can bring the humor, right? He's the guy who can bring the witty, you know, comebacks <laughs> and stuff, and you'll see a little bit more of that in two. Whereas Batman and Robin or Batman and Superman speak a little more like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, right? They're not, they're not cracking wise. They're just sort of bantering back and forth, but not in a funny way. Like in a, you know, I mean, in a dry, in a very dry way. How about that? It's a Batman is still very dry in this, in this incarnation. So, um, we know you're he's not, uh, he's not Adam West. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. We know you're, you're the writer on it. Uh, who's, who's the rest of the team on the book? Uh, Dan, oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, Dan Mora is is the artist. He's phenomenal. Oh, that's it's, beautiful uh, art. Beautiful art to go with that story. Yeah. Uh oh, kind of lost your sound there. You're getting kind of staticky. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Use the. There you go. Uh, use, there we go. Use the Bluetooth mouse at the same time uh, as the mic, and it goes all screwy. Um, <laughs> So uh, Tamara Bondolin, who I assume I've never asked her, I assume that's how you pronounce her name. Uh, she's, you know, our colorist and she's amazing. And I also want to give, you know, a shout out to our letterer, who I really dig. I mean, that's, uh, you know, Aditya Bidikar, I believe, again, God, <laughs> don't waterboard me and make sure I've got that exactly right, because I've never, you see their names, right? And you communicate yeah. with them and you, and you talk with them in email and stuff. But until you actually write, you know, until you actually speak their names, I want to make sure they're absolutely right. So anyway, that's the team. And then Paul Kaminsky is the editor in charge and his assistant Dave is amazing. And, you know, everybody's really, everybody's setting everybody else up to succeed, which is all you can ask for. Oh yeah. Like I said, a great story and it's complimented by the amazing art. I, 
I yeah. opened this. I was like, oh, this is a great. So is this an ongoing? Is this is this an oh, ongoing? Yeah. Oh, no, thank not, yeah, typically it's gonna take it's gonna take dynamite <laughs> to get me off this book. Yes. <laughs> I'm right. I'm writing this. I'm right. Whether it lasts six issues or 600 issues, I'm writing this one into the sunset. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, and you, is... said, you were talking about marching orders. So they said, so they, somebody came to you and said they wanted a timeless book. And so okay. I was, I, I'm just wondering how much is that? How much is that was the editorial mandate and how much was you saying, I, I want to put this in this. I want to put this in here. I want to put this in here. That it was that the, I want to put this in here, this in here, this in here. That was all me. Basically, okay. the, the umbrella edict was, and again, knowing what I want anyway, it's not like there was, I don't feel like I was dictated to so much as given permission, right, to go timeless. And so from there, you know, I mean, Paul has said, like, flat out, he never gave a rat's ass about the Doom Patrol until he read it in a story, in, until he read issue one. He's like, now I care about the Doom Patrol. So <laughs> I like surprising my editor as much as anybody else. I know. I mean, and th I think it's been a long, long time since Metallo has been like considered like a, like a big threat. Yeah. And th mm -hmm. I, I got that in this issue too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had Metallo came, it came backwards. I mean, really what I wanted to do was a red kryptonite danger and, and mm -hmm. show you how really nasty and brutal and horrifying and, you know, with body horror that krypton red kryptonite can be, it's not just a goofy thing. And from there, you know, we'll kryptonite in his, inject that into his heart. And you got heart, kryptonite. Oh, okay. Well, Metallo's got to be the right, the guy. Well, this has been, uh, it's been a while since you've written Superman uh, regularly. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it, was it Birthright the last time you wrote Superman regularly or? Yeah, I think so. That's, that's the last chance I've had. I may have, I may have touched upon him in a project here or there, but yeah. Nice. And something we talked about, Will, uh, you were you were the edit, weren't you at the editor or one of the editors on the Action Comics Weekly, like way back in the day? Back in the day, yes. Boy, geez. why <laughs> why would you why are you reminding me of this? That's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> I'm not, you know, what am I? What am I? A war criminal? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, sorry, Action Comics Weekly. You know, like a year or two ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a bunch of a bunch of us were basically. It was it was, you know, not exactly an all hands on deck situation, but cranking out double the normal size comics every week for 42 weeks was a, a, a constant scramble. There was, you know, I, I'll never forget. There was one story that came across or it was like a Green Lantern story about halfway through that run. And the story took place on a yellow spaceship, which is the whole point of it being a Green Lantern story because he can't do anything. And the colorist, God bless her, had completely spaced on those instructions. And so the story didn't make any sense. So editor Dan Raspler and I spent a frantic lunch hour literally recoloring the whole story from scratch. That's the kind of stuff we would have to do all the time because the the the, machine, the grind was there and the machine kept churning away. And so you get some good stuff in there. There's some, you know, Blackhawk stuff is good stuff. Dead Man stuff is good stuff. You get Phantom Lady, you know, a noble effort, but not really working. Um, you know, it it. It was a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's insane. I mean, yeah. trying to do one 22 page issue a month is hard enough. Doing a double sized every week is just. Right. And not just doing a double size, doing a double size with, you know, Multiple different, stories. like five or six different stories by five or six or, or 10 or 11 different creators. If you start counting inkers and writers and, and colorists and stuff, so you're managing an entire comics company's worth of talent at that for point. One issue. <laughs> for, yeah, for one issue, yes. I do not recommend it. 52 was hard enough. And that was because, you know, we, we had only like a core group of six or seven people. So that we could get by with. But I can't, I, no, no. If, if 52 had been 48 pages, we'd never, we'd, we'd still be on week 22. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So is this the fun? So is this like maybe the funnest thing you've done because you don't have to worry about continuity and it's basically just like whatever I can think of, you know, as long as it has a timeless feel, I can do it. So far, it's the most fun I've had for I, I don't know how long. I mean, it was just, you know, I clearly I was not welcome at the door at DC for a long time. And then there was management change and I got four calls that same day, two of them before lunch, asking me to come back, which is very flattering. And so, uh, yeah, it feels good to be home. Nice. Well, if, I mean, we've, we've seen, you know, the first issue 
you know, two, four has been solicited. Mm -hmm. How far have you kind of plotted this out at this point? I've got, uh, I've turned in the first six scripts. The first five are this story, six, every, like every sixth one will be a breather uh, that will be in the, in continuity, but, uh, you know, internally of, of the book, um, but gives Dan a breather so he can get ahead. So, uh, I've turned in the first six and I know what the next five are going to be after that. Uh, and then that's in, you know, that's in pretty clear focus to me. And then beyond that, I've got ideas that I could go for years. Right. I was going to say, you, I don't think you ever come light. You know, it's like your flash run. You had years on that. That's uh, like this man comes with stories. <laughs> There's also, I mean, honestly, there is something different about writing an ongoing as opposed to a limited series. I, it, there's just the rhythm of it is different and it allows you to make spontaneous decisions. It allows you to, you know, change things, you know, you get to issue five or whatever, and you realize you have the opportunity to turn left instead of right, because you don't have to button it up with a V end. And that's the end of the trade paperback. And that's it. I really enjoy. And, and obviously, we're going to do them in chunks, so we can collect them in trades. But even still, there's, you know, there's going to be runners for, you know, months and months and months or, or what have you that callbacks or whatever, because I, I like that. I mean, it's you're able to build something much I think much richer if I had done flash as nothing but a series of mini series back in the day, rather than a hundred issues and straight, it would have been a completely different animal. Hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Did you have to go in with a hundred issues? <laughs> oh, that's him. That's head? him. No, no, that's no. him. Okay. Right. I'm like, that's a pretty tall order. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, is that just a, uh, 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 a thing of the business now that you all, you're always have to think of like the trade, uh, you know, how's it going to look in trade? Yeah. I mean, you can take it very literally and, and like I said, just do it in, in discrete chunks. I, there's some, but there's some wiggle room there. There's some wiggle room to, to make sure that there's a bridge between this trade and that trade and that trade, rather than have to feel like there's just, you could read them in any order, you know, or I can do, or I can do three and two, or I can do, you know, four and one. I can do as long as it comes out to, you know, four to six or seven issues worth of material. That's, you know, nobody says five. It has to be five. It's just, it's yeah. somewhere in that ballpark. Well, our, I know DC and Marvel have kind of cut back their page counts to about 20 pages per issue. Is I, mm -hmm. I didn't count the pages. Is this a 20 issue, 20 page issue or mm -hmm. are you doing more? This actually, this actually 22, I think is the new DC standard. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, it had gone down to 20 at some point, and I think Marvel's still at 20, uh, but I think DC is standard at 22. And this issue, first issue is 32 pages. It's, you know, it was 22. And then Paul, my editor again said, you know, we can just leave out the ads and put in the 10 pages that we ran as a prequel in Detective Comics, which doesn't cost anybody any extra. It's still the same amount of money and it's an extra, so it's an extra bonus. All we did was you know, take out the ads and replace them with story pages. So even if you read that material before, it's not like, you know, you're double dipping or anything like that. You're still getting what you would have paid for. Nice. Very nice. I mean, yeah, I, you know what? That makes sense. I mean, it feels a little thicker, but yeah, great story. I didn't even notice there was no ads on the like, man, this story's <laughs> flowing really smooth. Yeah. No. <laughs> cool. uh, oh yeah. That doesn't affect, I guess I would have figured that the ads would. I guess not bring the cost out. I don't know. I guess. I mean, in theory they do, but the reality is it's not really. <laughs> it, yeah. It, it, the reality is it's less rev. It's less that you derive revenue, serious revenue from those ads and more that if you had to pay artists and writers to do 32 pages every month, first off, they can never deliver that much. And secondly, the book would be more expensive. So, cause you'd have to pay for all that material. So 22, I think is a, is a, it's fairly arbitrary, but it's sort of like, okay, here's what we think the budget can withstand for this particular book and whatever revenue we get from ads from Nike or, you know, Snickers or whatever, that's, that's gravy, but it's not like make anybody rich money. So you, you mentioned earlier, you, you got a few calls <laughs> yeah. on a certain day. Um, and we have world's finest, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you uh, going to be, 
dipping back into the DC project? Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Anything I mean, you can share? Uh, I mean, you know, we were supposed to keep it a secret, but uh, but Brian Hitch, you know, spoiled for some time ago that we're he and I are doing a, a three issue black label Superman story uh, that is essentially a, a sequel to Birthright, if you will. Um, and that's coming up as soon as I finish writing the damn third script. Uh, <laughs> and then beyond that, the yeah, there's there's more coming out. There's another big non Superman thing that I'm doing for DC that I probably another couple of months away from being announced, maybe a month. I'm not sure. Excellent. Oh. So, okay. So you're doing a black label book. So does black label give you more freedom where you're like, okay, I don't have to watch language. I'm going to watch this or, or you go in where you're like, okay, this is black label. You know, people are going to expect a little extra for their money so that you're, that's in the back of your head. It's like, well, I have to come up with something, you know, a little more just because it's black label. A little more sophisticated. I mean, that's that's just yeah. it. It's not it's not so much. I mean, there's no need for, you know, sex or language in there to be any different than it would be in a regular Superman story because it would feel yeah. weird. Like there's just no, you know, the, all it really all that really does in terms of that context is give me the ability to have Luther say Jesus Christ rather than, you know rather than gosh darn it or whatever, <laughs> um, or come up with cute colloquialisms like that. Uh, but the, the, Diggity dang. <laughs> but, but the angle of the story, like the, the, the basic subject of the story, the basic hook of the story is, I think, designed to be a little more thought provoking and a little more provocative than your standard monthly Superman comic. Cool. And de dealing with issues about Superman that we don't normally deal with on that level that we're dealing with. Well, you, you mentioned you mentioned Brian Hitch. Yeah, I, I have to mention Heaven's Ladder because yeah, I freaking thanks. love Heaven's Ladder. That you I have the beautiful and book. <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome book. <laughs> Thank you. That's a beautiful looking book, man. I am I am really proud of that work. And I'm you know I I here's a secret about it you didn't know, which is that when we pitched it originally, the idea was we wanted to have at least two fold outs in the book so that you could have like a, a, a four page spread for Brian's big work. That sounds great creatively, but as I got into it, logistically, the problem is because of printing and the way that we print things as signatures of like 32 pages or whatever, mm -hmm. you can only have those fold outs at certain specific points in the book. And it, once I started trying to write with that with that in mind, it became more of a gimmick than anything else. And it became the rhythm and the pacing of the book became weird. And so we had to let that go. I, I hope somebody else takes that shot someday, but it has to be more carefully planned than you would think. That makes a lot of sense. And like when you have like a visual like thing like that, can you, will they move ads around for that? Or you know, like if you tell them like, hey, we have like this tooth, you know, don't break this up, you know, with an ad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, generally, yeah. I mean, you can't do that with any giant consistency you know you can, they're not gonna like throw all the ads in the back but i you know they'll make exceptions here and there i mean sometimes you do it because you need the real estate and sometimes you do it because you know your artist is or you or your artist have forgotten that you know you have to start a two-page spread with an even number or else you're screwed so you know it does books don't work that way you can't have a spread on pages five and six you know <laughs> They don't just do it if you forget to put a page turn, right? Oops. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember a few months ago, like when they, when Brian Michael Bendis was leaving Superman, me and Lilith were like, "Oh, oh, Mark Wade's gonna write Superman, right? Mark Wade's gonna write Superman." But I think I like this better because you get to write Batman and Superman on a monthly basis. It's not so much in continuity, so you really get to stretch your legs on this. So it, you, know, I th I, yeah, I think better. That... I th Yes, I I don't think I would have taken the I don't think I would have taken the monthly big big job. Oh. Not because I don't like the characters. I just I mean again, it's just that's not a Superman that and, and that's not a world of Superman yeah. that I can relate to as much as just if you let me go free range over here, mm -hmm. you know it may not, you know it may not be as vital to the DC universe right now, but that it just feels better. And actually, that's part of the machinery here too is that in order to make sure that people don't just blow this off as, okay, I don't have to read this issue issues one through five set up something that is going to pay off very shortly in the main DC universe, like right now. And the same with the next arc of stories is the, the idea is to do something that 
tells the backstory to something that, oh, and it, then it turns out that a couple of months later, here it is in JLA or here it is in Batman or whatever. And, you know, you don't, I don't have to do that every single time, but I think at least at first to show people and to fully demonstrate that this is not just a book you can ignore. You know, this is a book that actually still has a place in the DC universe. It's just set in the past, but it's planting seeds for now. Well, are there any, uh, any toys that, uh, you know, we mentioned the doom patrol. Uh, are there any toys that you're just like itching to, I going to get to play with these as well as Superman and Batman. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a list of like 50. I mean, I went, we went through and like made a list of like 50 things, but you know, I, I love Metamorpho. I think there's no reason Metamorpho can't show up sooner than later. I really, really want to do the man bat bizarro team. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what that looks like. I don't even have a story, but I just think that's a, that's a cool idea. Um, there's all kind of, of villains and, you know, sort of not B level, but you know, backburnered heroes that you can do stuff with. Again, it, it it's, it's just my way of saying, okay, I've given a lot of thought, an unhealthy amount of thought to, I don't know, the metal men over the years and, and an unhealthy amount of thought. <laughs> and I think I can show you something about the metal men, for instance, that you've never thought about that make, that may, may make them look much cooler to you than you might, you might initially think. And that's kind of the goal. That's when I do all, when I bring all these toys out, the goal is, I love these characters. I want to show you why I love them in hopes that you will love them too. Excellent. And I love these B list of hit heroes and stuff, but are we going to get any more? I know Hal Jordan's coming, but any more justice league are we going to get a uh, wonder woman or a maybe Barry Allen or Barry Allen shows up uh, in the first arc. Uh, wonder woman kind of shows up, uh, but only kind of uh, you'll see. I think it, what do we have? John Jones shows up. Um, Firestorm shows up, yes. Kid Flash shows up, uh, just in that first five issues. And again, not for any great length of time, because, the, because here's the other thing about, I'll, here's another secret of writing comics. I'll tell you the problem with guest stars is that once you put them into the story, it's very difficult to write them back out of the story, right? <laughs> you know, once, you know, once Dr. Strange has joined the fantastic four to help fight Dr. Doom, it's not like you can near the end of the story, you can have Dr. Strange go, okay, I think you got it now. I'm going to go. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to be very careful with guest stars that way. Mm -hmm. And is it even a little more difficult because this is already a team up book. So it's like, okay, our, so is there, there's already two here. Now we're going to yeah. introduce the third one. The fourth yeah, one. Put a hat on a hat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. But that said, it's the fun of it to me. And this is very evident in the Supergirl and Robin subplot is the the combinations of characters and the kind of relationships they have. Like I always said this about when I was writing JLA, I said, I don't own Wonder Woman in the sense that I can do something with her that you, that you wouldn't be doing in the, in the monthly book. Cause you can't change that continuity. I don't own Aquaman, but as a writer, JLA writer, I own the relationship between Aquaman and Wonder Woman. Right. And the same thing here at this, at this exact moment, I own the relationship between you know, Batman and Superman, or I own the relationship between the Doom Patrol and Batman, or I own the relationship between Metamorpho and Superman or whatever. And putting those characters together, it's not just a matter of putting them on the page and making sure they're integral to the plot. Putting those characters together is a large part, a large part of the fun of it is just how do they react to each other? What kind of conversations do these people have? What do they see in each other? And what do they bring out in the other person in the story that is something that we've never seen before? So since you've written all, so many DC stories and now you're writing this, do you think continuity helps or hurts? Should we kind of let it fall by the wayside sometimes? We need a reboot. I mean, what's, what's, what's the, what's the formula? I think it's kind of a dumpster fire at DC right now anyway, but in a good way, <laughs> like in a, in a way that allows everybody to come and take a swing and just do the best story they want to do. You know, Grant and I talk about this all the time. There's a difference between continuity and consistency, right? Mm -hmm. Like continuity is, you know, this happened three issues ago. Consistency is the Simpsons. Consistency is Bart will always be 10 and there'll always be a tiki head in the basement and Homer will always work at the nuclear power plant. And that makes it easier. Like I'm not, 
it, it's cool to be able to reference and do continuity bits if you can, but it's it's an add-on, right? It's a it's a value add. Really, what you need to be concentrating on is just is this a good story that doesn't violate the principles of the characters or doesn't make the, the you know still keeps the characters pure as and and keeps them on model. Hmm. Yeah, and if you know, I think it was Kurt Busiek that said that uh, if it's not per pertinent to the story, just don't refer to it, right? Just don't refer to exactly. Don't you know? Go out of your way to contradict stuff. Just try. You know, don't. There's no need to pick up. You know, there's no need to refer to it if it doesn't help your story. I was, yeah, it's like I don't know. Could is is some? I mean, you you could like show off and like. Yeah, I mean, you know, eighty years of DC history, and it's but it's just like you know, it's like, do I want to try to shove facts down people's throats every issue? It's like I don't think you know. No. Right. And sometimes there's just judgment calls. Like I, you know, let's say I want to use the Phantom Zone projector in a story. Well, I, I kind of know in my head what the Phantom Zone projector looks like because, in in my mind, it's looked this way since like 1964. It doesn't, but nobody's drawn it like that for 20 years. And so, or, or a better example actually is the Fortress of Solitude. And you know, my Fortress of Solitude is a, has a big yellow door on it and isn't made of crystals, but it's that's the way it looks now, and that's the way so many people in see it, that it would be weird for me to say, no, 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 we're going to go back to the 1950s version of the Fortress of Solitude, because all it's going to do is call attention to itself, right? Mm -hmm. So you make everything's a judgment call along those lines. Well, I, I know you were saying, you know, oh, don't mention, you know, call, you know, nostalgia and stuff, but it's it seems like that's what's selling. I mean, Marvel's doing a bunch of callbacks to the 90s. I know uh, DC's doing Batman 89 right now. They just did Superman 78. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like some of this previous stuff, you know, there's a hankering for some of this, you know. It, 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 there is. It's just it's it's so easy to go too far with that. It's so easy yeah. to forget that, as I said you know, a lot of that audience is gumming its food. So, and they, they will, that audience is going to die off pretty soon. The, you know, the, you're talking about if we want to do like a book about 40s characters or whatever, the average age of that audience is dead. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, you, you, you got to stay relevant and you've got to make sure that, you know, your target market is still picking up the book or else my fear is that the, you know, nostalgia fans, the retro fans are not, enough in number to keep anything moving. I do feel like it felt, as I read older comics, that, you know, in the golden, later in the golden age and in the 50s, or silver age, excuse me, it had more of a wholesome vibe. So maybe you can kind of bill it more for younger people, or like younger kids too, too because... No, I'm, you know, some I of the can, comics I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not that you want to write all ages, but I potentially that could be right. You no, know, another, I mean, another I mean, in my mind, that's what a Superman book is anyway. A Superman book is something that should be all ages, but not, and again, this is not to cast version on anybody else who's doing Superman. I'm just saying that my, like the guardrails for me are not something that have to be given to me because I've been reading Superman stories for 50 years. And so I yeah. kind of instinctively think I know where the guardrails are to the point I don't even think about it, right? It's like driving a car. You don't think about every little decision you make at this point. You're just, you're in the zone. And the same with writing Superman. I don't, you know, I think the, it should, it feels like I want it to be, you know, it should be something that every age can, can read without it seeming silly or, or childish, you know, with more of a Muppets Pixar vibe, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that said, I think the way you keep it contemporary is the stakes and making sure that the stakes are high because they never really were in the Silver Age. Um, so making the stakes high, making the relationships more interesting and more layered and making characters choices a lot more dangerous and a lot more suspenseful. Like that's uh, there's a point in issue four where I have, I put a problem before the characters that actually made my editor gasp out loud. Like, I don't know how I would solve that. And it's not like, a, how do I get out of this trap? It's more like, oh man, somebody's going to make a sacrifice and it's got to be one of us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's good drama. 
And that's not just, oh, geez, how do I defeat the parasite this month? That's something that's actually in, integral, you know, really character-driven drama. Yeah. I will admit I was coming at it more from a Batman perspective. So I was like, oh, this is not as gritty. And you could read it too. <laughs> right. And you, you could read it. You, you can hand, you're right. This is the one like, Batman. Oh, awesome, I think. <laughs> yeah. This is the Batman book you can hand out at Halloween. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have a. I know you. You're. We have to be careful of your time, but I have a super important question for you. Okay, hit me. Super. Did it? Great? I, by the way, I know it's not a. I know by the by the setup, I know it's a trivial question. But go yeah. ahead. Did it bother you that Batman comes first on Batman Superman World's Finest? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I get it. I totally get it. You want it if you, stores out al alphabetize their books. And yep. you're going to want it with the Batman books because those sell better. So I get it. But you know what? It doesn't matter to me because I just call it World's Finest. All my scripts call it World's Finest. I, all my correspondence and emails call it World's Finest. I don't ever speak the name Batman Superman World's Finest in this house or to my editors. It's just, it's World's Finest. Well, I mean, maybe something in reverse. I mean, because it wasn't always the house that Batman built. It used to be the house that Superman built. So. <laughs> oh, it was. I mean, what it, it was until... The I mean, 80s. <laughs> I would say, I mean, Superman was still the flagship character for DC really into the 80s. And it really wasn't until the Tim Burton Batman movie that that it was, at that by that point, it was sort of neck and neck. And then the Tim Burton Batman movie cemented Batman in the public consciousness in a way that he is now and probably forever will be DC's flagship character. Whereas, you know, years ago, it was for forever. It was Superman. Well, yeah, I mean, we had those Christopher Reeve Superman movies, and then after those, we didn't get another Superman movie until, what, 2005, in the, into the 2000s. So, I mean, I think, yeah, we had all those Batman movies in the, you know, 89 okay. and then through the 90s. Was there a Superman, was there a Superman movie in the, in the century? <laughs> I, I've heard a rumor, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Anyway. We're also, li we're also living in a sad, gritty, Batman-esque era, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> the world feels more like Gotham City than Metropolis often. <laughs> I just I just like winding up the Snyder boy, the Snyder Bros, because they are, <laughs> oh, they are a, yeah. a, a sad and rabid bunch of people. So, <laughs> um, so now this is trivial, not a super question. Um, but <laughs> Phil has mentioned it to you before. I told him to ask about Diggity Dank. Um, and you said you remember, and I'm still trying to make Diggity Dank a thing. So I feel like maybe if you can <laughs> slip it into World's Finest somehow, maybe we can maybe we can gain traction. I I I, I wouldn't hold my breath, but that you know, but have at please by all means continue on your on your you know La Mancha quest. quote quest your your Don Quixote quest to uh, tilt at that windmill. I I will I salute your effort. Oh, you'll make her day, you'll make her day if Dick Grayson can say that. It's a pretty amazing <laughs> phrase. When I read I was like, dang. Really? That I just I just think that's a giant landmine of a of a phrase. So <laughs> is it too is it too nineties? It <laughs> it's very nineties. <laughs> that's a timeless book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what? any other Oh. I don't think so. Uh, yeah, any other last questions? I mean, I do have to wrap up, unfortunately, in a few minutes. So, dinner, but... this, so again, this was something that Phil was supposed to ask you before, but it kind of goes with communication. So, um, because we were reading your Flash stories and where back in 93, Nightwing and Starfire come in and Wally comments in his internal monologue that they're married. But, of course, their marriage went up in flames. Yeah, uh, they, in, but they were going to, that's just it. That, yeah, that was, they were going to be married. Yeah, they so gonna, that's I mean, that was that was the plan in the book that they by the time yeah, we got so I there. Yeah, I was kind of asking, like, what is communication like, or like, how did that happen? Why did no one think to tell you? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, I think, as I recall, it was a, a, an incredibly like eleventh hour and fifty ninth minute, you know, change in in the, in the plans at Titans, and it would just came too late for us to fix. So, told you. Were you, were you annoyed? <laughs> Were you were you annoyed that they didn't tell you? <laughs> oh, I no. I, you know what? It's you and six other people, the only people who remember. So I, I'm okay. I just uh, didn't know if you were like, oh man, they made me say something wrong. 
<laughs> not annoying, but yeah. All right. So yes, we'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the time. We always appreciate it. Uh, is there anything you, anything you want to uh, plug besides Batman, Superman, world's finest or world's finest? <laughs> um, let's see, I mean, what else am I, what else am I doing? I mean, I'm still the publisher at humanoids publishing company and you know, we do the ink Cal, we do the meta barons, but we also done a ton of really awesome graphic novels uh, that have been coming out. And I would encourage everybody to, to take a look at their previous catalog under H and see what's there. There's some really good stuff. Awesome. All right. All okay. Right. All right. Thank you, sir, so much. You Thank you. Always appreciate it. Always a good you time. Bet. Over and out. Thank you, Dang. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, you made him. You made him leave. Uh, he was leaving anyways. <laughs> I love him. He's always a good time because you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. He's like, oh yeah, DC's kind of a dumpster fire, right? He's working for the people. He's like, yeah, D he worked there for how long? He's like, yeah, DC's kind of a dumpster fire right now. <laughs> And but he was wind. very diplomatic. He was like, oh. didn't say it was a dumpster fire in '93. But... Likes to wind up the snide. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, so easy. Cool. So, <laughs> I mean, he's like, now I feel like, Will, you sound like you know much more about uh, Superman. It clearly, <laughs> from what I can tell, clearly the Snyderverse was too dark for Superman. I felt like it was even too dark for Batman. It was so dark, <laughs> so dark. I mean, he's branding people to get killed in prison and stuff. Yeah, I'm like, that's not bad. That's not bad, man. Batman doesn't kill. And, you know, Paul Kent wouldn't say, you should have let him die. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. no, just no. He's supposed to give him his morals, not, oh, you should hide your powers. Yeah, let him die. Yeah. <laughs> that was for <laughs> that he get it for himself. He's like, no, 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 don't say him. Let me die. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like no. I said, we're not we're not in a wholesome era right now. <laughs> well, hopefully, I mean, we're getting, depending depending on who you were in the past, it was not that wholesome either. But um, <laughs> I generally mean, speaking, I mean, hopefully, it's getting better. I mean, spoilers at the end of the Batman, which just came out on HBO Max today. Will I mean, like his villains survive? Well, most of them survive. So uh, that's a good thing. I mean, Batman is Batman is supposed to be a literal paragon right of justice mm -hmm. of yeah there's other things going on with him but he he serves justice you know from outside the system yeah but it, that's a that was, that was kind of my point to mark wade it's like how long has it been since we've seen that you know yeah like grim and gritty you know batman it's like oh i'm gonna have to hold myself back from killing you joker you know stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah it's gonna be awesome oh wait it's gonna be Diggity dank. <laughs> I tried. See, I, I said to him, I said, hey, put me, put that into Grayson's mouth. Uh, Kristen, <laughs> that. That's all right. I'll just imagine it there. I'll rewrite some of his dialogue in my head. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that's, I guess we're old because he said that's 290. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I didn't even read it until, I don't know, like the 2010 somewhere in there. Yeah, no. I was like, this is awesome. But I was going to say, like, she's the youngest one here. That's what she's clamoring for. It. <laughs> and I am I the oldest one? I'm the oldest one here now. <laughs> I think well, I, I was gonna I say, say, I'm pretty old. Uh, I was going to say, I think Mark Wade's older than you. Yeah, and then yeah. it's you, then it's me, then it's Chris. Get off yeah. my lawn. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's good. I can't wait for issue two. Comes out tomorrow. Ah, and you know, hey, we had the Weaponeers of Quard. Yes, so, uh, in the first with, issue with Penguin. Yeah, with Penguin. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> you well, know, I'm excited to see how this Robin Supergirl subplot develops. Because yeah, I think they've he's right. Yeah, they've really they've interacted a few times, but mostly as Nightwing. Or then many years later, when she was on JLA and Dick was on JLA as Batman. But wasn't that Matrix or was? I don't even remember which Supergirl that was. Oh yeah, um. I know I think, it was, was, I think that was Kara, wasn't it? He interacted with, you know, when they brought Kara back, what was that, like 2005 or whatever? But, you know, I'd say, what, pre-crisis? Did they ever have any interaction? He said just a few isolated panels, like when yeah, they ran the same the same panel, same. Yeah. Well, pre-crisis, I mean, Dick Grayson, when, he became Nightwing, what, just right after Crisis? No, right before. It was right like, before. Was like 80, okay. Three or eighty four, wasn't it, Kristen? Yeah. So yeah, it was before. Yeah, yeah, the only place of dying. 
What? That's when uh that's when Tim becomes Yeah, Tim Robin. Drake. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, well originally there wasn't well it's Judas contract in New Teen Titans. It's like that's yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, but there's one where he's kind of is interacting with Kara in a Teen Titans one from maybe when uh Jeff Johns was writing it. It's that era, it's that era when he wasn't in it, but it's like a little bit ridiculous because Kara's just writing like I heart Nightwing or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah, that's, 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 that's I feel like it's really awful. not the best portrayal of a supergirl there. <laughs> Yeah, no, they brought her back in like the mid two thousands. Yeah, they really, really went over top right here as like a teenage girl. So, yeah, it seems like she hadn't aged. Yeah, and then she was back when Dick was Batman. Because remember, there's one where she interacts. With oh Dick yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. She's like, oh, you're crushing her, and she helps him move the car, or whatever. She's just like, what's <laughs> the car with one hand? No, and she was part. Of, and she was part of the Trinity. Because remember the Trinity when Batman yeah. was when Bruce was dead was Donna and Dick and Kara. Oh yeah. They're in that Justice League. That was good times. Good times. Was, was, it it was it she a Red Lantern for a while, or was that at New 52 continuity? Because I'm totally not ke- keeping up I, with continuity at this point. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. That might have been New It was either right before or like when New 52, you know, not too long into New 52. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think, obviously, he knows what he's doing. And Mark makes a good point that... Yes. Continuity well, can be tough. It can be yeah. a dumpster fire. But I feel like isn't... I mean, I can say this as a historian. History is kind of a dumpster fire as well. So <laughs> it fits. Well, well that, that's what I'm thinking. And, th- you know, this book might sell because it's the classic versions. And it's like, hey, hey, kids, you don't, have, you don't have to remember, you know, 50 years of continuity to read this book, you know. Yeah, great writer, great artist. I mean, it's a good... It's a really, really good book. Yeah. That's what, I was gonna, that's what I was trying to tell him. It's like a classic feeling story, but it has like modern art, very like beautiful modern art. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I like it when they do that. Like he said, you can yeah. worship at your own church or something, <laughs> or something like that. You know, when they have, because um, of course, I'm coming at it more from a Batman and, well, and Robin yeah. um, perspective. But I like it when, yeah, when there's options where he isn't like, yeah. yeah. Phil and I, you know, we, we wouldn't know anything about worshiping different versions of a character green lantern excuse me uh <laughs> oh what's up who's your green lantern are you are hal or was phil teasing you about that i'm i i love i, I love hal jordan yes okay. <laughs> oh who's your green lantern cal rayner <laughs> oh what's up where's the love for john stewart yeah or guy john stewart's good john stewart's good <laughs> all right i'll take john stewart as my green lantern then how about he doubles as a late night talk show host yeah. <laughs> oh, <sighs> but no, I was gonna say, oh, did we get a spoiler? He was talking about that that um black label Superman thing he's writing, and he mentioned Lex. I was like, oh, Lex is in it. Spoiler. <laughs> and Lex might say bad words. <gasps> yes. Because no one because no one would see Lex Luthor coming in a Superman book. Have you read Heaven's oh, Ladder? Yeah. Have either of you read Heaven's Ladder? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Freaking awesome. It's oh, I yeah. mean, it's one of my favorite. JLA stories bar none. Um, yeah, I think I even like it more than the you know the White Martian. Mm. I'll write it down. When is it roughly? Uh, like are we uh, talking nineties or two thousands? Or did it? It was after. I think it was after Grant Morrison left. So it was like around yeah. JLA fifty because I think Brian Hitch was doing the art, maybe. But it's its own standalone. It's actually oversized. The original is an oversized treasury treasury sized. I think the it might be in a collection though. Hang on, I'll find it for you. I'm, sorry, I'm sure I can find it on the app. <laughs> uh, or you, and you can too, uh, Ray, because you got that app now. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to say, well, I remember reading that, that that was the original series, because I know he read the re- a regular series. Oh, bu- 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 came out in 2000. All right. Okay. And it has been reprinted in 2011 and uh, the JLA reprint series in 2011 as well. So DC Comics presents JLA Heaven's Ladder and then JLA Volume 5, I think is what it was. But it's uh, cool. cool. It's really an um, it's an amazing story, and it is on the app. So, but it's on the app. Awesome. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, oh. Oh. 
Oh, he was co-writer on that. Well, do you know who he uh, wrote that with? Hang on. I can't remember. I thought it was just him. <laughs> You're going to kick yourself when you see who wrote that. <laughs> do you want a hint? No, it's just him. I have just him writing it. Oh, because I'm looking on the app and it's saying Mark Wade, comma. This is Ron Mars. <laughs> No, I just when I'm looking it up on comics.org and it's just oh. him. I wonder if something else is collected with it. Oh, because I was gonna say, because oh, yeah, 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 because it's uh, oh, because DC won our Green Lantern won millions in it, and maybe that's oh, why. Gotcha. Wait, so how long was Mark not at DC? Did he not get along with Dan Dio, or did however you say that? Is that is well, that who, what he was referencing? Well, who did get along with the Dido? <laughs> I don't know. Um, when did he, when did he leave? Uh, I don't know. I was that I when he was at Marvel because he was at Marvel for a while too. Well, that would have been after two thousand if he wrote his letter yeah, in two thousand. <laughs> so I know his Daredevil run was after that. Uh, yeah, he did. Oh wait, well, he might have been doing both for a while because uh, his first Captain America run was in what the mid nineties. Right before <laughs> Heroes Reborn. Uh, uh, let's see. Because, yeah, I think those are his like top two. Like on DC side, his favorite Superman. Then on Marvel, Captain America is his favorite. He likes wholesome dudes. Yes. Yes. Heroes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, I believe. Well, Oh, I think it might have been in a like a text page in the back when his Captain America things. He said, uh, I think he when he was uh was he in college he did college radio or something, he called himself Captain America. That was like his like DJ name. Nice. Um, <laughs> um let's see. He's my head's just spinning. I don't know if I'm on an episode of Green Lantern or Nightwing. I don't know. <laughs> That's right, kids. While he's looking, yes. If you if you love the will already and want to get more, go check out Sector Two Eight One Four, the Green Lantern podcast. If you love Kristen, check out Nightwing News. And they're both stuck with the same idiot uh, as a co-host. So, <laughs> so who has to run all the tech stuff, Phil? <laughs> I know. Uh, it looks like it. he was doing Champions at uh, Marvel back in 2018. So I think it was oh. probably before 2017. Oh yeah, he did like a uh, an Avengers run too. Was mm -hmm. that that weekly? Was that weekly thing? Uh... But no, like like when I brought up that uh, Action Comics Weekly, I'm like he, you know, I know a lot of them on both sides of the street have done weekly comics now, but I think you know they kind of set the. Uh, oh, I, I can't. Kind of created the the mold for that the weekly comics thing. I can't. Uh, it looks like he did Indestructible Hulk. There's Original Sin stuff oh, yeah. in here for Marvel back in 2014. He's he's one of those guys. It's like you forget half the stuff he did. It's like, oh yeah, he did that. Yeah, he's yeah. written so many things and so many good things. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, um. Not seen anything in 2011, so. Yeah, when did his, like, his, like, he end Flash completely? Wasn't that, like, it was before New 52, right? I think it was right before Barry Allen came back, so it might so, have been, like. Yeah, 52 was in 2007, 2006 and 2007. Uh, Brave and the Bold, 52, The Flash, DC. Uh, looks like his DC stuff stops around 2008, 2009, I think. Yeah, the, the Flash, the 87 Flash stopped in 2009. Ah. Is that when, is that when Barry Allen came back? 2009, yeah. That the, sounds about the, right. Did they restart it? Yeah, I think they did restart it at that point. Well, yeah, Barry got like a like a year of like a book again and then they and then new 52 hit flashpoint <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah flashpoint which created the new 52. 52 yeah although i see mark wait up through 236 and that says it's january 2008 and then they got some other people in there yeah. well yeah, jeff johns actually has a run somewhere in there too doesn't he and then he does in the 200 in the like 
217 on for a while. Yeah, that was actually kind of just like a couple for Mark Wade near the end cuz yeah, Jeff Johns is doing it for a long time. Yeah, cuz like he was the, he was like the big one before Jeff Johns and then eventually he came back after Johns' and run fin- and fin- yeah. ended out the run. Yeah, I need to go back yeah. and reread a bunch of those. Yeah. That's well that's when he brought the you know, the, him and Linda had the kids and stuff and like he's I think one of the last times I talked to him, he said like people didn't like the family thing. But guess what? Guess what they're doing in the regular flashbook right now? Wally, Linda, and the kids. <laughs> yeah, maybe up through like one fifty nine, like he was on Flash through two thousand. Yeah, he he did take a couple breaks. Like I know what was in around one twenty nine, he stopped, and then Grant Morrison did what a year, and then he came back. Yeah. Came back. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's funny. Um, those two have really, I mean, you know, left their mark on DC Comics, you know, uh, just because of everything, Grant Morrison and Mark Wade. Oh, yeah, yeah. Know, because of everything that, uh, everything that they've worked on, you know, separately and together. It's pretty amazing. I, I know, just like all the great work he did on Flash, I'm surprised it's not his favorite character. I mean, I think he likes him, but he's like, oh, yeah, no, Superman's a favorite. I'm like, jeez. <laughs> Because <laughs> kids, Speed Force, that was Mark Wade. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's good sometimes to not write your favorite, though, because Maybe. then you can be a little more objective in, like, what's a good story instead of just, what's something I want to see my favorite character do? <laughs> or, you know, what's something I... Because the part of the thing, I think, is you have to make these characters human and so they have to sometimes make mistakes yeah. and that can also be hard when you're, when you're writing you don't your, want favorite, your favorite character yeah. to make mistakes <laughs> so and i mean but, it, then, it, but then the stories would be terrible if they were perfect <laughs> and he wrote wally too wally was more of an average guy than even barry was so yeah well and you know it's funny when you, when you start thinking about barry he was an uncool police officer just for a second, don't think how weird that sounds. Okay, <laughs> just just go with me. He was an he wasn't a real police officer. He was just a crime lab guy. Yeah. But then you know we had twenty years and four hundred series of why CSIs are so freaking cool. <laughs> so <laughs> how CBS built? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he Barry couldn't be cool. Right, he had but, again, but again, it was like, you know, from the 50s to the 80s. Oh, yeah, forensics isn't cool. Now it's like, oh, hey, man, forensics. Forensic science, yep. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just like, he, he wrote Wally like a, you know, like an average person. It's like, hey, is it a pain waiting in line? I remember there was one issue. Hey, is it a pain in the wait in line at the bank? Hey, imagine if you had super speed, how, how, how much more impatient you would be. <laughs> Or he had or he had Wally come home one day, throw something in the microwave for I don't forget it was like a minute or two. Wally yeah. runs, takes a shower, does like a couple other things, and he's just like, come on, come on. You know, he's all patient. It's like oh, a minute or two. Was that one of the crossovers? Yes, that, that was, was the uh, Lantern crossover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, we did that with Lil. That is right. Okay, and uh yeah, for those of you missing Lil this episode. Let me get a rat on your alligator back, bro. There you go. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, any <laughs> anything else? We've talked to Mark Wade. We've done some DC history, <laughs> and we've yelled at people to get off our lawn. So, yes, Mr. Yeah, Cass. I think that about covers it. <laughs> We're coming our food. That's right. So, yes, kids. Uh, once again, if you want to hear Kristen, Kristen, go check out uh, Nightwing News right here on this podcast every week. Uh, her and I talk something Dick Grayson, whether it's Nightwing, Robin, Grayson. Whatever. And if you want to help her out, go pick up uh, Dick Grace and Boy Wonder on Amazon because she doesn't like to do her own plug. Yes, Dick Grace and Boy Wonder on Amazon. She talked to some uh, comic creators and uh, there's a bunch of uh, things on in there about Dick Grace. And if you don't know Dick, yes, go pick it up. Uh, go get up to date. And the man who has no problem doing his own plugs, Mr. <laughs> Will Allred. You can catch him on Sector 2814, the Green Lantern podcast with me. So, Yes, Will has no problem. Will, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Walred. That's at W-A-L-L-R-E-D at Gmail and Twitter and Facebook and probably some other social media things that I don't even know I have anymore. 
Um, and you can also find my self-published work, uh, Crossover Division at crossoverdivision.com. You can also find Diary of Night at diaryofnight.com. And uh, besides the awesome Sector 2814 uh, with a certain super dude, <laughs> uh, Phil, uh, I uh, host a, a weekly podcast with writer Kevin Joseph of Tart, and we talk to uh, comic book Kickstarter creators uh, who have some live uh, projects running about uh, their projects, and we have them uh, explain themselves, basically. <laughs> so, explain themselves. <laughs> uh, which is the name of the podcast, Explain Yourself. Um, so, And then, uh, obviously, you have great taste in characters because you either love Nightwing or the JLA or Green Lantern. So you should check out Quasar. Uh, at the Quantum Zone, quantumzone.org. I, of course, love how Jordan. That's right. Seems like I'm getting a package every other day. And he, he does not have an ego on him, kids. I <laughs> am God. <laughs> <laughs> Miss the days of the live reads. The live yeah, reads, yeah. Star Blast, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> That's right. All right, let's get out of here. All right, kids. All right. In one week, Lil' Hellfire will be back. If any, either of you want to join us, I believe, Will, you said you're already going to join us. We're going to be talk, doing another interview, Mr. J.M.D. Mateus, who's written a few Justice League things at this time. Yes, and I've got to read the Spectre before then. <laughs> what? Oh, no, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. The Spectre yeah, yeah. before then. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's written a ton of Justice League, not only comics, but he's written for that animated series. So He knows a few things about the Justice League. All right, kids. Come back next time. Get yourself some justice. <laughs> well, it goes unlimited justice. <laughs>